very early in California right now, isn't it? It's very early in the morning. The sun is just coming up now. <laughs> well, at least there's sun. That's a that's a bonus. Yeah, I mean, I think by the end of it, it'll be uh, there will be uh, sun sunlight. <laughs> we got a little bit of snow uh, yesterday, uh -huh. the day before. Yeah. Is this the start of the winter season? It's, a, it's an early start for us, actually. Got it, but got it. Yeah. Gotta love climate change. Very hard to predict these days. Yeah. Right. Give it another couple minutes as people are coming in. I'm not quite to. All right. I just can't wait to get started. I'm waiting for people to just settle in. Um, but why don't we start then? So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third lecture in this year's Dalhousie Health Justice Institute seminar series. I'm Sheila Wildman, Associate Director of the Health Justice Institute. We're grateful to convene today's lecture and this year's lecture series in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We pay respect to the indigenous knowledges held by the Mi'kmaq people and the wisdom of their elders past and present. We also recognize that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies, and contributions have enriched that part of Mi'kma'ki known as Nova Scotia for over 400 years. Today, we are delighted to welcome Professor Rabia Belt from Stanford University Law School, who is joining us online for a lecture I cannot wait for. So again, I'll be brief as I can. Her lecture is entitled, The Hidden History of the U.S. Insanity Defense. Professor Belt received her JD from the University of Michigan Law School in 2009 and her PhD in American Studies from the University of Michigan in 2015. She's a legal historian whose scholarship focuses on disability and citizenship, topics ranging from cultural analysis of disability and media to contemporary issues facing voters with disability to the historical treatment of disabled Americans. In 2015, the American Society of Legal History named her a Catherine T. Prayer Scholar for her paper, Ballots for Bullets, the Disenfranchisement of Civil War Veterans. I wanted to make mention of another formidable original contribution, an essay in the Georgetown Law Journal published in 2022 entitled The Fat Prisoner's Dilemma, Slow Violence, Intersectionality, and a Disability Rights Framework for the Future. It's a paper that I encourage you to pick up as well as the rest of uh, Professor Belt's work. Uh, it challenges disability rights paradigms to take on carceral injustice, and helps open the way for intersectional emancipation struggles. Professor Belt is currently writing a book titled Disabling Democracy in America, 
Mental Incompetence, Citizenship, Suffrage and the Law, 1819 to 1920, forthcoming with Cambridge University Press. Rabia Belt is also an advocate for people with disabilities. In 2016, President Obama named her as a council member to the National Council on Disability, the independent federal agency that advises the president, Congress, and other federal agencies on policies and practices affecting people with disabilities. And she's also served as a member of the board of directors for the Disability Rights Bar Association. So with all of that, um, I turn it over to you, Professor Bell. Thank you, thank you so much. And greetings from California. Um, thank you for that warm welcome. And to Sheila Wildman um, for inviting me. I look forward to chatting with Aaron Dobelstein's class later on today and to Ashley Johnson for making all of the arrangements for me and to all of you for attending this talk and to Laura Slykwa for doing the captioning. Um, this is a fairly new uh, paper that I'm going to present part of for you today. And I look forward to the conversation that we'll have after the presentation. I welcome your thoughts. I'd also like to say at the outset, um, some content warnings for some violence that I will discuss, including homicide and suicide. And there will be the use of some older pejorative terms for mental disability. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. So with a uh, PowerPoint and let's get started. So on April, sorry, on June 15th, 1843, Abner Rogers killed Charles Lincoln. This is a slide of Charles Lincoln, who is the warden of the Massachusetts State Prince Prison in Charleston, Massachusetts. There is a image of a fairly young white man with luxuriant sort of a brunette hair, fairly young, wearing a formal black suit. Rogers had just begun his second stay for forgery at the Massachusetts State Prison in Charleston. And when the prison doctor, William Walker, examined Rogers along with the other new prisoners on the day of his admittance, Rogers complained of a pain in his head and said that he felt as if he could not govern his mind. And this is a picture of the state prison in Charleston, which is an older sort of faded black and white image of um, the building sort of with a series of rows of uh, rooms. Rogers complained of a pain in his head and said that he felt as, quote, he could not govern his mind, end quote. Dr. Walker consulted with Lincoln, the prison warden, and they both believed that Rogers was faking both the pain and the mental issues and that his real problem was that he was an onanist or masturbator. Consequently, Dr. Walker refused to treat Rogers medically and instead recommended physical labor to keep his mind off of masturbating. At night and the days before the killing, other prisoners and prison attendants heard Rogers groaning in his cell. He appeared for work without shoes and a hat and said there were, quote, checkerberries in his food. His mutterings included, quote, I have fixed the warden and I'll have a rope round my neck tonight. I am in great distress here. I'm in pain all over. I am in pain right through here and feel as if I could not govern my mind. And don't take me up to the old prison and kill me. If you will not, I'll behave myself, end quote. The deputy warden punished Rogers for his disobedience through solitary confinement, physical restraints, and shower baths. So here's a, um, a diagram showing this showering treatment um, where prison attendants would hold down Rogers um, and pour cold water on him. And this was both to, it was designed to 
calm people down, but then also was a method of punishment in the prison. On the day of the killing, a week after his arrival at the prison, Rogers moved frequently in and out of the mattress making area of the prison where he was working and muttered to himself. When Lincoln came into the mattress making area, Rogers took a shoe knife, a common knife of the value of 20 cents, held it in his right hand and struck Lincoln three times on his back, neck and throat. The prison attendants and prisoners in the room pulled Rogers off Lincoln, but the warden was already dying of his wounds. And the deputy warden then put Rogers in a solitary cell to await trial. When the news of Charles Lincoln's death hit the press, Massachusetts newspapers initially treated the murder or killing as another lurid sensationalistic story for their readers. And this is a slide that says, horrid murder in the Massachusetts state prison, the very melancholy duty devolves upon us to state that the estimable, estimable, <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's a little early today, and um, I would probably not get this right anyway if it was later. Estimable warden of the state prison, Charles Lincoln Esquire, was murdered yesterday between five and six o'clock in one of the workshops of the state prison in Charleston. As another example, the Boston Post gave its readers minute detail on the killing itself, including the shoe knife, quote, plunging into Lincoln's back and the severing of his carotid artery. The killing was labeled an awful tragedy where the warden was suddenly deprived of life. While Lincoln was described as a, quote, moral reformer without cant, a shrewd and sagacious observer, yet charitable in his judgments, not likely to be deceived in the character of his prisoners, yet mild, though firm in the discipline which he has employed to restrain their evil pr propensities, end quote, who left a wife and 11 children, quote, a more wretched and miserable being than Abner Rogers, the murderer, it would be hard to find even in a state prison, end quote. These local newspapers called for and they expected swift punishment for Rogers. They also expected an ultimately unsuccessful insanity defense by Rogers' lawyers. The Pittsfield Sun, for instance, cynically noted, quote, the ground of defense was insanity, of course. Ultimately, though, they were wrong. Abner Rogers did, in fact, plead not guilty by reason of insanity for killing Charles Lincoln. Yet, despite all these expectations to the contrary, this plea was successful, and he was transferred to Worcester State Lunatic Hospital. Rogers is appointed counsel. Prominent law Boston lawyers, George Tyler Bigelow and George Bemis, subsequently published a report of the trial proceedings due to the case's publicity. And this is an image of the defense attorneys of George Bemis and George Bigelow, both white men wearing suits, and then also an image of the first page of this case report of the trial. Judge Lemuel Shaw, um, the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, and Herman Melville's father-in-law presided over the trial and the subsequent appeal. This is an image of Judge Lemuel Shaw, who also has very uh, buoyant hair um, and is wearing a formal suit and looking sternly at the photographer. Um, Judge Shaw, who historian Leonard Levy has argued no other state judge through his opinions alone had so great an influence on the course of American law, sat as chief justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court from 1830 to 1860, and he authored 2,200 opinions covering a wide array of legal topics. He had a disproportionately large impact over the development of US criminal law. Among other contributions, He dif differentiated between murder and manslaughter. He gave important definition to the reasonable doubt standard and permitted convictions based solely on forensic evidence. In Rogers's case, his jury instructions and appellate decisions formed the basis for the introduction of expert witnesses into criminal trials. The experts in the Rogers case included Isaac Ray, then the superintendent at the State of San Asylum and Augusta Maine, the author of a widely read treatise, a treatise on 
the medical jurisprudence of insanity, and the future editor of the American Journal of Insanity. Luther Bell, the superintendent of McLean Asylum, the preeminent private lunatic asylum in the country at the time, and Samuel Woodward, the superintendent of the state lunatic hospital at Worcester, Massachusetts, the model state lunatic asylum for the nation, the founding president of the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Institutions for the Insane, and the supervisor of the institution where Rogers was eventually placed. And through the efforts of these expert witnesses and the blessing of Judge Shaw, Rogers imported the McNaughton right wrong test, which is the current prevailing test for insanity in the United States from English law into the United States. So this is um, far from a routine criminal law case. Yet despite its fame or infamy when it occurred, Commonwealth v. Rogers has all but disappeared from American memory. Um, contemporary American law students are quite familiar with the McNaughton insanity defense and aware that McNaughton's case is the overseas case that, quote, modernized insanity within criminal law. And this is a slide of Daniel McNaughton um, from 1856. So it's a white man who does not have buoyant hair um, standing with his arms crossed. In 1842, Daniel McNaughton thought that the British prime minister, Sir Robert Peel, was conspiring against him and thus shot the man he believed was Peel. In fact, this man was Peel's secretary, Edward Drummond, who died from the gunshot wound. McNaughton's 1843 trial focused upon his sanity or lack thereof and how to assess it legally. After the McNaughton trial was stopped, basically sort of a directed verdict, a subsequent debate in the House of Lords with judges on the insanity standard birthed this McNaughton rule on insanity, which updated the legal test for a criminal insanity from a person acting as a, quote, wild beast or laboring under an insane delusion to one that asked whether the defendant knew what he was doing when he committed the charged act and if so, if he thought it was wrong. So US historians and presidential trivia aficionados are also familiar with the assassination of President Garfield by Charles Gateau in 1881. And this is an image of Charles Gateau from Puck. It's a satirical cartoon of a drawing of a man with an oversized head who has a gun in one hand and another, um, a document saying an office or your life. Charles Rosenberg's landmark study, The Trial of the Assassin Guteau, Psychiatry and the Law in the Gilded Age, is a path-breaking investigation at the intersection of law and psych psychiatry. And the contemporary American public though, is probably far more familiar with criminal insanity through another aborted political assassination this time on American soil. So um, in 1982, John Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity under the McNaughton standard for his attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan and wounding of three other men. This is an image of John Hinckley, um, his arrest photo where he's holding up a sign with his name um, and the date. Um, he's wearing a striped shirt and is looking straight at the camera. Rather than incarceration within a prison, Hinckley was committed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital for treatment. Current US law students are taught that the outrage over this verdict, insane instead of guilty and the intended result, treatment instead of punishment, cut short the development of the insanity defense and criticisms of the incoherence and limitations of the McNaughton test and catalyzed new laws restricting the use of insanity defense or attempting to end it altogether. So compared to the spectacular afterlife of those cases of high politics, homicide, and insanity, um, Rogers has been relegated to a footnote at best in contemporary criminal law casebooks. 
Yet I argue that Rogers deserves greater scrutiny by scholars and the rest of us, and more attention would yield an array of benefits. Okay, so first I'm going to unpack the case a bit. So, um, and then I have a slide of Worcester State Hospital, which is Lunatic Asylum, which is a there's an image of a very bucolic looking series of white buildings with some horses in front. When it came to Rogers's case, both the trial report and the newspaper accounts are in general agreement over the events leading to the killing and the killing itself. The battle was over what this chain of Abner's activities meant and how to assess them. In particular, did he have malice when he killed Lincoln and was he legally insane when he did so? And legal precedent gave the prosecution an advantage. This Massachusetts criminal law adopted English legal principles. Um, since the 1300s, the will was an important part of determining guilt for murder. And prosecutors needed to prove not only that the act of the defendant caused a killing, but that the defendant had a guilty will or intention as well. Um, in 1682, in one of the first systematic treatments, a mens rea, sort of thinking through this guilty mind. Lord Hale wrote, the consent of the will is that which renders human actions either commendable or culpable. Where there is no will to commit an offense, there can be no just reason to incur the penalty. When it came to malice by a defendant, it was not necessarily overt that court could impute malice based on the defendant's action, but an insane defendant lacked the capacity for a guilty mind and therefore could not be found guilty of uh, murder. Samuel Parker, the prosecutor in Abner's case, had a lot of advantages. So first was the juxtaposition of the defendant and the victim. So there was a person who was already incarcerated at the time of the killing and a repeat offender at that versus a respected family man of 11 children. And Massachusetts law and society was still absorbing new developments and understanding the mind and treating mental illness that could potentially weaken his case. Parker suggested that Rogers killed Lincoln because he was a person of bad character. And in a more muted register, he argued that Abner killed Lincoln out of revenge for ordering his punishment through the showering. I think that he didn't want to emphasize the details of the showering itself out of concern that it would seem as if Rogers actually did have a reason to hurt Lincoln for torturing him. And indeed, Rogers was the last person in the Massachusetts State Prison that was subjected to the showering treatment. And Parker argued that Rogers was faking insanity because he seemed lucid for the most part, both before and after the killing. He contended that even if Rogers might have been partially insane, he was not insane enough to be found not guilty by reason of insanity. And he reassured the jurors of the fairness of the legal procedure itself, that if they found Rogers guilty of murder and thus he was sentenced to death, the legal system gave him a fair trial in reaching that result. So for the prosecution, Massachusetts benevolence was displayed through people like Ward and Lincoln and also in the legal process. By contrast, Abner Rogers' defense did not seem to have a very good case. The prosecution's witnesses clearly outlined a sequence of events that led to a horrific killing and legal precedents favored the prosecution's view of malice and insanity. And the public did not know the medical theories of asylum superintendents very well. And the prison doctor, Dr. Walker, testified that Rogers was faking his insanity. And none of the asylum superintendents that testified had actually examined Rogers before the killing. Only one of them did so after the incident. And the rest only saw him at the trial itself, where he only said a single word. Moreover, newspapers carried the story of Lincoln's murder and called for Rogers' head even before the trial started. And the defense counsel conceded the difficulty of his client's case in his opening statement. George Bemis Riley pointed out to the jury that newspapers implied that Rogers' counsel would set him up for the plea of insanity 
and confess that, quote, there's so much going against Roger as the task of developing the truth in regard to this transaction is so difficult a one that for myself, I feel oppressed and almost overwhelmed with the responsibility which belongs to the humble share I've undertaken in this matter, end quote. Bemis then proceeded to turn the prosecution's case to his advantage. And he also had a multi-pronged strategy for how to do this defense. So first he addressed the jury's prejudices about the insanity defense directly. He argued that the abuse of the insanity defense in law was not the fault of defendants using it too much, it was actually too little. Um, and that juries do not believe insanity defenses as often as they should, and thus sent defendants who could have been found not guilty by reason of insanity to the gallows instead. Second, that Bemis used asylum superintendents as his key witnesses. All three of these superintendents emphasized their extensive experience in treating insane people, and all three superintendents were unanimous in their opinion that Rogers' insane behavior was real. And furthermore, they indicated the punishment that was inflicted by Rogers in prison not only failed to treat his problems, but in fact caused his violent outbursts that killed Lincoln. As a result, Dr. Walker, the prosecution's only expert witness, failed to diagnose Rogers correctly since he lacked specific specialized experience with insanity. Moreover, by prescribing the type of treatment aimed at disciplining criminality, rather than treating insanity, Dr. Walker exacerbated Rogers' condition instead of curing it. And the favoritism of the superintendent's testimony may have rested in part with Judge Shaw's experiences off the bench. So Shaw was a member of many of the reform groups and organized in Massachusetts on behalf of insane people and also for the better treatment of prisoners, including the Humane Society and the Prison Discipline Reform Society. In addition, before assuming the bench, he was a member of the Massachusetts legislature and took an active part in creating statutes classifying insanity. And Shaw praised the medical treatises on insanity during the trial itself. And third, the defense suggested that Rogers' insanity was hereditary. Abner Rogers' father, Abner Rogers Sr., testified for the defense on what he thought was the prevalence of insanity in his family. According to Abner's dad, his son had fits starting when he was a baby that continued as he aged. Rogers Sr. reported that, quote, Abner's great uncle and aunt by his mother's side were both reputed crazy, end quote. Most strikingly, Roger Sr. described the condition of Abner's older brother, Bamaya, who was, quote, deficient in understanding. Bamaya hit Abner on the face with a scythe when Abner was three and cut off part of his nose. Starting when Bamaya was a child to the age of 30, when he calmed down, the Rogers family would tie him to a chair or tree for their own protection. Finally, the defense emphasized the stakes of the jury's decision. Since murder was a capital defense, a guilty verdict would send Rogers to the gallows, not back to jail. Instead of looking to American law for precedent, Bemis wanted the jury to bring in this progress evidenced in the new understanding of social reform, insanity, and criminality into the courtroom that was there both in terms of developments in English law but then also in terms of Massachusetts society and the creation of new institutions designed for the care of insane people. Bemis concentrated his closing argument on the types of arguments used in the case. Specifically, he urged the jury to utilize this witness's more modern view of insanity rather than the older uh, legal precedent that Parker employed. So, thinking of insanity as something that did not have to be total, that it could be partial, that people could have preoccupations on a specific thing, but that would still be insanity sufficient enough to reach 
this new legal threshold that English England was developing. And Bemis also highlighted the rapid proliferation of reform institutions that had sprouted in Massachusetts. And with this increased attention to insanity and criminality, proper classification of insane people and um, criminals with their respective institutions became more important for reformers. And his closing statement drafted the jury as part of this benevolent vanguard to usher Massachusetts into this modern future. They could do so by finding Rogers not guilty by reason of insanity and placing him in one of the, quote, spacious and magnificent hospitals which now open their doors to receive all those afflicted with the loss of reason, affording to them the high benefit of the highest medical skill, end quote. Beam has called on the jury to use the, quote, noble monuments of the benevolence and charity of our community. And so the change, which has taken place in the public mind in regard to the nature and treatment of insanity within the last 20 years. That said, though, if Rogers was found not guilty of by reason of insanity, he would be transferred to Worcester State Hospital, not a place like McLean, which was a private asylum that catered more to um, paying patients. Worcester, by contrast, did not have the financial resources to offer most patients this new benevolent treatment that the asylum superintendents uh, witnesses discussed and the Bemis implied that Rogers would get. None of them mentioned that part when they were testifying or giving statements. So given the evidence presented to them, the jury may not have seen a not guilty plea as an entirely outlandish gamble. Clearly punishment had not worked for Rogers. He was in jail when he became a killer. Furthermore, Bemis gave a compelling reason for using the expensive institutions that grew up in the public's midst. A successful insanity defense would not send Rogers free to roam dangerously among the public, nor would he lurk behind the, beneath the public's attention like his brother, Bamaya. The jury's verdict would merely transfer him to another institution that could possibly cure him. Moreover, the same people who wanted Rogers found out guilty by reason of insanity, the superintendents, would be responsible for him. Probably seemed unlikely to the jury that the superintendents would define a problem for themselves that they could not solve. Even the newspapers applauded Bemis's closing statement and congratulated Massachusetts for its modern spirit in trying Rogers and the eventual verdict, um, despite the fact that they were calling for Rogers to receive the death penalty at the initial uh, descriptions of the killing of Charles Lincoln. Regardless of the reason for the jury's verdict, they eventually found Rogers not guilty by reason of insanity. On May 17th, 1844, Abner Rogers killed himself by jumping out of the window of Worcester State Lunatic Hospital. And this image is um, notes from his death record. After learning from his death, his lawyers, Bigelow and Bemis, wrote Samuel Woodward, the superintendent of the hospital, asking for his expert opinion on Rogers' suicide and if it in any way changed his opinion on the trial. Woodward replied that he had no idea that Rogers intended to commit suicide. Rogers appeared happy at his job, mattress making, um, though his pulse was frequent. Woodward dismissed Rogers' suicide as, quote, acting from impulse, yet despite his surprise at Rogers' death, he remained adamant that Rogers was, quote, insane and irresponsible when he committed the homicide. So at the time that Woodward wrote his letter back to Bigelow and Bemis, his career was ascendant. He was a star witness in a prominent trial. He was the superintendent of the most respected state asylum in the country. And he was the founding president of the professional association. This prominence proved fleeting, and in only a few decades, interprofessional quarrels, institutional overcrowding and a lack of funds, and the rise of neuroscience tarnished this nascent field of psychiatry. And psychiatry did, though, retain its um, inclusion within the law through expert witness testimony and on the landscape through mental health institutions that closed only a few short decades ago. 
Um, but the field only regained its reputation through its incorporation of biomedical language in the 1900s. Though Rogers has disappeared in instruction in our memory, I think the chronology of the U.S. insanity defense from McNaughton to Hinckley without Rogers overlooks important developments in American social welfare and carceral institution building. It also foregrounds a narrative of dangerous political intrigue rather than one of how criminal law was reinterpreting broader ideas of social control and deviance and thus creating a population of mentally disabled people that the state both was crafting and then assigning itself responsibility to manage. And shifts in the insanity defense heavily relied on the presence of asylums and psychiatric hospitals. It's far more tenable to release people accused of violence, yet deemed insane to another institution rather than set them free. And this benevolence of criminal insanity feed the development of this group of mentally disabled people who are not imprisoned, yet they remained unfree. And the spectacle of violence, the debate of treatment versus punishment, and the lobbying of reformers and the professionals of this psychiatric specialty catalyzed the state to invest more research sources to manage a problem of its own creation. Also, like um, we're dealing with um, both then and now, the what can be done to people who are within institution. Um, in Rogers's case, there was um, the specter of the gallows if he received the death penalty for the case. But even within the prison himself, when he was there for forgery, he was subjected to the shower treatment, which was criticized as being an act of torture. He also experienced solitary confinement as well. Um, even though Abner was the last prisoner who was showered in that particular prisoner, prison it did persist elsewhere. Um, and it is, I think, it's an image and sort of a practice sort of very reminiscent to the waterboarding that um, was very prominent in the discussions of US torture after 9-11. Also like to call your attention to the institutional labor that happened. So the labor was designed both as a cost saving device for the institutionals running, but also it was designed for different rationales for the people within it. Note that Abner was doing mattress making in both prison and also in the lunatic asylum, but they were supposed to be for different reasons. Mattress making in the prison was designed to give the prisoners something to do during the day, but it was also uh, designed for their rehabilitation. Whereas mattress making in the Worcester Lunatic Hospital was designed to restore Abner to sanity. And also the issue of sexuality, namely masturbation. Um, so this is uh, several images. One is a device, uh, sort of a circle with a very formidable teeth on it. Um, and the image of a stooped over man with a cane. And this is someone who's supposed to be suffering from the effects of self-pollution or masturbation. Um, and then the, the cover image of a book written actually by Samuel Woodward, um, Hints for the Young on a Subject Related to the Health of M Body and Mind. And then part of this was um, characterizing masturbation as a serious problem and also hints to stop it. Um, there was a concern that it prevented men from turning into women for sexual activities. And also sterilization later was intended both to prevent men from reproducing, but to stop people from masturbating. And there's this tangle of medical disorder, morality, and criminal criminality. Um, there might be folks in the audience that are familiar with the case Buck versus Bell, which is this infamous um, United States Supreme Court case that um, permitted sterilization under the US Constitution. But there's also Skinner versus Oklahoma, which is a 1942 Supreme Court case, which said that the Oklahoma Criminal, State, Criminal Sterilization Act of 1935 was unconstitutional. Under this act, the state could sterilize someone who's convicted of three or more crimes. There were felonies involving moral turpitude. 
and Jack Skinner had these three convictions, it was ordered to be sterilized. Um, it was found that this act violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment under the US Constitution. Um, and I just want to note here that um, this language of moral turpitude and then also the felonies that were labeled as such really took off after the US Civil War as a way to disenfranchise newly freed Black people um, because people who were convicted of felonies of moral turpitude were also disenfranchised. Um, so far, I've been talking about people who are white, but there is also a racial story here, both in terms of the internal management of the white American population, and then also the management of folks of color. Um, and then also Skinner um, found compulsorily, sorry, compulsory sterilization is punishment and that's unconstitutional, but there are still a lot of workarounds that happened, um, which I can talk about during the Q&A as well as blatant violations, especially for people in institutions in which they're sterilized. Also, masturbation itself um, was characterized as something that caused insanity. And with the DSM, the Diagnosis and Statistical Manual, which is a guidepost for psychiatrists and others and insurance companies, um, they removed both homosexuality and masturbation as sexual behavior disorders in 1973. Um, I think the campaign to remove homosexuality as a psychiatric disorder to receive far more attention, but just sort of want to note that masturbation was also something that was both connected and part of this campaign. And then finally, Rogers is not a clear cut case of social control. Abner Rogers is, um, father testified in favor of an insanity defense for his son and narrated a fraught family history of mental illness and violence. For him, New Asylums offered a solution to hidden family violence, visible criminal violence simultaneously, as well as an opportunity to save his son from the gallows. So consequently, I think Rogers offers significant avenues of investigation for contemporary scholars of welfare, disability, psychiatry, law, health, and criminal punishment and jurisprudence. And I think it suggests a stronger historical connection to current issues that bedevil health, psychiatry, disability, and crime, and what to do with their intersection than a long ago case might suggest. And thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Belt. That was really, um, that was a lot. Uh, and it was <laughs> it was a lot to uh, to process, and just I know that we'll be reflecting on it um, for a while. I just want to remind people uh, who are in the webinar that there is a Q and A uh, button that you can press, uh, and you can um, write a question out in the Q and A, and I'll be able to moderate that. Um, you could also use the chat function if you're having problems with Q&A, but I, I would prefer it if you're able to put it in the Q&A function because it's uh, easier for me to follow. But let me just um, kind of start us off by returning you to those connections between then and now, because I'm so interested, even just in your, in your discipline, your cross-disciplinary work in history and law, um, which we don't hear enough. Um, we don't hear enough of that in our seminar series. As I reflect and I think about the kinds of richness that um, that comes from looking at the past and thinking about those shifts over time um, in our institutional sort of forms and legal um, doctrines. Um, but I, I want to kind of pull you back to what I see as kind of the two prongs of of the story, but these are, there were so many ways we could process the story. Um, and one relates to the pathways, sort of the pathways out of the prison and into the institution. Um, and so that goes to things like the legal test. You know, many of us are very interested, listening keenly as we think about all oh, the McNaughton test and, you know, what's being tested. Is it uh, understanding or cognition? Is it will? Is it something like affect? Um, and we start to process these things and think, well, is there a lesson here about refining the test, 
you know um and i i ask that to you knowing that you are you know sort of cultural and historians uh uh such that you are probably you're thinking critically about all the tests but i so that's that's kind of like question one is reflection from you in light of your historical you know the attention you've paid to um these processes um so your reflections on that pathway which is the legal doctrine around um insanity in the criminal uh space and then the second piece and i think we i'll i'll just pitch it but it's something that can be unpacked in a lot of different ways um is the uh the state response is to so the uh, the construction of that that second space. So not the prison, but but what the the therapeutic. I mean, is it the um, the institutional response, uh, which you very deftly, I think, have already constructed as something of a mirror world, even through the mattress. You know, the mattress making happening in both spaces, and it makes me wonder how is daily life different in space number two. Than space number one, which is still a question that clearly, you know, dogs us as um, as we think about how best to respond to disability, both um, disability sort of that has manifested or been constructed prior to incarceration, and and disability, uh, as you bring out in in some of your other work, right? Disability that we have to be so mindful about is is created through uh, incarceration. Um, so I guess I'll just uh, stop talking and pitch it to you again in terms of this insights on the, the construction of that pathway um, out of uh, the, the prison or the you know, prison uh, criminal justice space and into, I don't know even how to describe the other space, the um, psychiatric space, and then maybe we can think more about the um, institutional forms question. Great, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, part of the reason why I wanted to do this paper, and I came across this case really early in graduate school, it's been sort of mulling in the back of my head since then, is that I feel as if part of it really resonates with our current debates over mass incarceration and prison abolition and sort of what to do. And one of the things that makes me really wary about perhaps an easy turn to care is feeling we have been there already. And <laughs> this case is very much about um, pointing to the harms of prison, like, and the problems of criminality and the turn to care. And in itself, that care space had its own issues. Um, so for one thing is that they're not as distinct, I think, as reformers and others characterize them as. So both in terms of what happened to people within them and even though what was happening in the care spaces was not intended to be punishment, still seemed very coercive, violent, harmful, sort of things like that. Um, and then I think that, um, one thing that I think is also sort of difficult is that the differences in terms of due process and the United States context. So if you are in the criminal system, then you get far more due process in terms of what is the procedure to get there? And so there is a distinct um, time you're supposed to be there and sort of various other things. It's a lot more nebulous when you're in the care side, right? Um, because it's not um, supposed to be punishment. But as we as we show, I mean, sort of as I hopefully sort of show a bit that it seems very, very reminiscent. Um, I think one thing that I think was lurking in terms of what I said, but I can sort of bring it out here more is of what the demographics are of the folks that are being sort of shifted from one side to the other. Um, especially with respect to class. So one of the things was the unintended consequences here was that asylum superintendents had this early win, quote unquote, in being declared expert witnesses 
in criminal trials, right? So the first issue of the American Journal of Insanity in 1844 talks about the Rogers case. And the initial afterlife of this case is very much focused on the fact that asylum superintendents were granted this deference to being the experts on the mind, right? But one of the things that then happened was the pathway they were creating were of funneling people from the criminal uh, system into the public asylum system. So for people who were potential paying um, patients, they're like, we're not going to Worcester, we're going to McLean, right? And that for the superintendents who were on this campaign of respectability for their profession, they ended up being essentially the wardens of the um, patients that they found the least desirable. Um, and for the prison, the prison superintendents, like, sure, you can have them. Um, and then I think it sort of ended up being part of the reason for the lack of continued resources, the overcrowding because of the the folks that were being put in these institutional spaces. Um, that said, though, I think part of uh, talking about Abner's father is to also resist an easy comparison of that institutions are the entire problem, right? That of what was happening in the family um, was not great either, um, that they were trying to do this self-help in terms of what to do with Mamaya, um, which was detrimental to him and then detrimental to the rest of the family, right? So of uh, this tricky issue of what to do about care that is not coercive, that is not one that is being thrust on people um, is something that's really hard. Um, when it comes to the issue of the test, um, one of the things that was a challenge with the test initially was what did it mean in terms of this issue of right and wrong? Is it understanding um, that something is legally right or wrong? Is it understanding whether or not something is morally right or wrong? Um, I've written in a separate article, which everyone is uh, welcome to download, um, about this um, something that is a thread that gets pulled out of this case um, with the deific decree doctrine that if someone believes that God told them to kill someone, um, that they're they're able to um, sort of plead not guilty by reason of insanity. This is one of the examples that is part of Rogers, right? That of this push and pull between legal and moral wrong, right? So if you think God is telling you to do it, they think of it as the Abraham and Isaac problem, right? In terms of God telling Abraham to kill Isaac, his son Isaac, right? Um, then the person may think that this is morally right, but it's legally wrong to kill someone, right? So that was something that was initially that they were grappling with. That said, though, this, um, this ricochet between um, legal right and wrong and moral right and wrong was something. There was also a lot of criticism of why is there this focus on understanding and cognition to begin with, um, especially as psych psychiatry developed. But because of these things, of these charismatic cases, cases like Kinkley, case, um, sort of fictional cases too, in which this idea that people are faking insanity, people are getting away with something, um, that, it, I think, undermined a more thoughtful idea of what the insanity defense should be, um, and instead sort of brought us back into this older 19th century world in which um, there's still a lot of fuzziness about what the test is. Yeah, and and seems to me like there is still, yeah, there is still that that fuzziness and there are still those tensions around, you know, whether somehow um, in Canada, we call it not criminally responsible. So, right, that would be the the, the label or the status, but is that somehow um, an easy, you know, the, the easy path or the path of the, the, the folks who have, um, you know, sort of uh, received an, an unearned 
you know, some kind of bonus. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about, about that again. And when there, there's a piece that came up um, along the way in your talk that again, sort of brought to mind some contemporary issues. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's all contextual as to which of these spaces the available spaces sort of in status as well as just in institu you know, institutional spaces, which of them is preferable in a given context and from a given perspective. And I really liked your you know, unpacking of the, the family space uh, and you know, the potential alternative um, in the example that you gave of the death penalty, you know, where the, the, the options before you are obviously really gonna um, make a difference to um, uh, to where you put your effort and <laughs> kind of qualifying. Um, and these days, one of the, the phenomena that, um, that comes up from time to time as I, uh, as I um, am aware is this malingering kind of label. So, and this happens both at the, at the point of, you know, trial where, where the, in our case, it would be the NCR determination is being made. And I often have just deep questions around how, how is that determination made? Like how, <laughs> what, what is actually happening in those, in those meetings and at so many levels? And I haven't done the study or had the experience to really um, try and unpick that, but I certainly see as a, one of the refrains, uh, this kind of maling malingering refrain. And I see it maybe just because of the things I'm more aware of. I see it e even more often, my own experience, in the, um, inside the jail or prison environment where people are, again, in terms of the options that are there in our world, it might be, you know, people would like to get to an RPC or a regional psychiatric center and out of the, the prison um, for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and this, this um, determination is being made as to whether they're sick enough or sick in the right way, uh, or are they drug seeking? That's a really common sort of piece or malingering in some other way. Uh, and I just wonder, again, um, in light of the historical work that you've done, as well as the contemporary work, is that something that you see or that you can help us sort of put a, a bit of um, some more thinking around in terms of how these tasks are not just constructed, but applied in these different contexts where, you know, people are, they are often seeking um, to get out of a of a particular space, but um, but that can turn on on them. Yes, absolutely. And I think that last thing that you said was um, really key too that it can turn on them. I mean the the question of malingering was something that was super important in the nineteenth century, and I think it's still really important in a bunch of contexts in the United States. Um, with respect to disability assessment um, in terms of getting welfare benefits, in terms of what's happening within the criminal system with getting diversion out. Um, this backdrop of our people faking having a mental disability so they can receive treatment instead of punishment or receive sort of welfare resources, things like that. So I think that there's a few things going on. One is that morality and character are doing so much work um, that of suspicion of people being a bad character. And it is that people are proving that they are good people alongside of proving that they are mentally disabled, which, which is sort of striking given that they, they have to travel together, right? That um, in order to be deemed worthy of being mentally disabled in order to receive say treatment or resources, that they also have to be someone who is of good character, right? So when it comes to someone like Abner, that the fact that he was thought of as bad character, someone of bad character was counting against him and whether or not he was insane. The, I mean, I my sense is those two things should not have anything to do with each other, right? But the, but it seems like it's really matters and in part because of um, both on the one hand, like 
the punitive nature of a lot of things that are going on. And then the stinginess, maybe it's different in Canada here. So we're told that it is like a, a sort of resources that are allocated. So the first one is that people are faking um, being mentally disabled because they're trying not to get punished. They're trying not to get harmed. Um, and I think the repercussions for that is, well, we'll make the other, we'll make the other thing that they're trying to get to also unpleasant, right? So that there won't be much of a distinction between them, right? Um, as a way perhaps to reduce that incentive. Um, and then the other part of like the gaining of resources is, well, we'll make them like, we'll have them stingy, right? So that um, if you go through that hoop as well, then you're not actually gaining much of an advantage. So if perhaps the thinking goes, it's not me, but if I'm putting myself in, this uh, sense of a legislature of that if someone is choosing between getting paid work versus getting sort of resource like um, sort of SSI or sort of other benefits um, because they're too disabled to work, right? Then it's like, we're going to make it really hard for that to happen. But then also we're not going to give you a lot of money and going to sort of have a lot of like um, sort of strings attached so it does not look very appealing, right? So then it ends up being like a race to the bottom and sort of both. And like, I think it is, all of this stuff is very connected to each other, right? Um, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I teach a poverty law course and we were talking about the, the doctrine sort of of less eligibility, this yep. idea that, right, to, to get social assistance, you've got to be sort of be willing to, undergo a kind of degradation that is right. sort of worse than the lowest paying uh, employment. So sim yeah, so I note that there is a question in the chat and I'm going to take a look or in the Q&A, um, which is sort of back to basics here, but it's a really important basic back to the, uh, the test. And so the question is, is the McNaughton test still the current test used in the US? How is it different than what is used currently in Canada um, oops, and in terms of Canada, uh, I just wanted to say really quickly, it's it's section 16 of the criminal code, which basically is a kind of um, like statement of McNaughton. So it says no person is criminally responsible uh, basically for an act uh, or a mission while suffering from mental disorder that rendered them incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of the act or a mission or of knowing that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for uh, helping. Thank you for helping me out on that. Uh, so the, in terms of what the Canadian context is, it's um, striking. Oh, and also thank you so much, uh, first anonymous attendee for um, sort of breaking the ice there. So I am very into Q&A, so I'm very glad that um, that uh, we're kicked it off. So uh, this appreciate language is also something that's part of our model penal code, sorry, model penal code, which is a, um, basically like model language that legislatures can use, sort of adopt whole and part um, to craft their criminal laws. So they also have the appreciate language, which some states do use and some states do not. Um, and then there's always been like, there's been a battle in terms of what does it mean in terms of appreciation? Um, so I think the quick and dirty answer is yes, McNaughton, like this question of whether or not someone can understand um, right and wrong is still the current test generally used in the United States. Um, criminal law is generally something that is by states. So we got 50 of them, but that is what most states use. So I think the um, people were doing, states were doing different things until Hinckley, and then it really sort of dried up and went back to that. Um, that said, though, I mean, I think to go back to the conversation that Sheila and I were having, there's a lot of other stuff happening, even within the criminal context. One is, are you competent enough to stand trial to begin with, right? So you can be held for a long time, um, before you even get to the trial, if you are thought of as incompetent. Um, and in the United States, you can get, you can be forced to take medication to make you competent. The other thing that is happening on the back end is post-conviction committal. So 
it is that people have served their conviction, but then are placed somewhere um, because they're still thought of as dangerous to society. So this is not thought of as punishment, um, which then means that it could be pretty indefinite in terms of the treatment that you get or don't get or how long you stay there. So I have another piece, again, you could download that um, called Mass Institutionalization and Civil Death. And it actually is about the other non-carceral spaces of the present day um, and how these people aren't have no political citizenship or power. And it starts out with a group of people that were committed post-conviction. Interest, interesting, and yes, there are many parallels in Canada um, to all to all of that. Um, so thank you for that. I want to turn to another question, um, which was, I'm really glad that this one has been asked. It says, following the idea of the previous question, do you believe that the assessment of disability is centered around white cis hetero men and oftentimes this assessment can be difficult to apply to racialized folks and women. Could you speak to how the assessment of disability can reconcile this disparity? It's a lot there. Yes, awesome. Thank you. Thank you anonymous attendee <laughs> number two. Um, I think it is a both and. So disability, like pretty much many other things, is certainly something where we can see inequality happening, right, in an intersectional way. So certainly I think that um, attention to race and gender and class and gender expression and sexual orientation um, show up in terms of assessments of disability. I think when it comes to marginalized folks, it is both an overrepresentation problem and an underrepresentation problem. So that there can be folks that are thought of as mentally disabled um, or mentally incompetent, and the aspects of their marginalization are read as mental disorder. Right. So um, I was talking about before in terms of I mean, one of the examples is sexual orientation um, in which being gay was something period, right, sort of uh, characterized as a psychiatric disorder. Um, and we're having challenges now in terms of being trans, right, in the United States and whether or not that is thought of as a um, psychiatric disorder. And then there's also interpretations of people's behavior, um, which can be read through sort of lenses of racism and sexism and whatnot. Um, on the other hand, though, there can be spaces of care or resources of care that are allocated to people that are not at the bottom of the ladder. So, for example, the institutions that I was discussing in Massachusetts are sort of this network of asylums that were generated to um, care for people so that they were not in poor houses, they were not in prisons. They were for white people. Um, so folks of color, at least before the Civil War, war couldn't get into them. Um, and this was something in which it was the management of sort of the internal management of the white American population. Um, this is complicated, I think, a bit of being at the bottom of that hierarchy was not great, right? So a lot of the emphasis there, uh, pre-Civil War was targeted towards Irish immigrants, especially with the potato famine. So um, in places like Massachusetts, places like Worcester State Hospital really filled up with Irish immigrants. Irish folks were thought of as particularly prone to insanity um, because of anti-Catholic bias, because of xenophobia. Um, so they, they had a both and, right? So that there was the privilege of being white, but then the vulnerability of being thought of as not, 
the bottom of the whiteness ladder, right? And the need to improve them. Um, and then sort of folks outside of that who are not white, right, didn't get care, period. This changes, I suppose, after the Civil War, right? In which um, there was far more attention to people of color. And that was that was more in an eliminationist sort of way. Um, I think that disability, I mean, this is a long answer, but I think that disability is one of those places in the United States, at least that um, we can see racism happening in a way that whiteness matters in which there could be technologies developed that are initially used to internally um, govern and reduce the internal hierarchy of the white population, which are then exported out to be far more draconian for people of color. So if we move from 1844 and then we move to like sort of the early 1900s, when we get into the heyday of uh, eugenics and sterilization, and we have someone like Carrie Buck and Buck v. Bell, Sort of, I don't think it's an accident that the early um, targets of eugenics and sterilization were white, um, because there was this concern of white decline, and it and then it moved from we're going to sterilize some white people to we're going to sterilize whole communities of people of color. So places like Puerto Rico, tribal um, like folks in uh, reservations, sort of black women in the south, um, things like that. I assume it's probably pretty similar in Canada, unfortunately, in terms of the history. Yeah, the very specific histories, but very, but absolutely, yeah, parallels. We, you know, folk. It's become common terminology to call prisons here the new residential schools, um, and so this idea of a kind of repetition and new forms of different, uh, uh, yeah, different strategies or um, processes of. Mm -hmm. eugenics and uh, um and uh but the the piece that you just described the way you just described it in terms of sort of the, um uh the lowest on the hierarchy you know the treatment of the lowest on the hierarchy uh of the white population then being exported out in an even more sort of degraded forms really something that i'm going to hold i see there's a another oh hold on no i think that wasn't i thought for a second i saw a question i'm going to ask a lot uh a last one that at least comes to my mind and if someone has something that they're just burning to put up um we can give it a couple minutes i know uh we've got just a, a couple minutes left um but as we talk about this i mean i think you've pretty thoroughly unpacked the idea of there being some obvious uh good bad binary in terms of whether um the route out of the um, criminal law path is, you know, um, a therapeutic sort of more just or um, more responsive um, alternative. But um, one thing that I've been reflecting on is the tack that some folks have taken, some scholars and lawyers working under the CRPD in particular, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, taking an approach, at least I saw it maybe more prominent a few years ago, but I maybe haven't been paying enough uh, attention, but um, taking an approach to say that it's simply discriminatory to have this alternative path, to carve out the you know not guilty by reason of insanity or not criminally responsible pathway is something that's discrete and particular to disability and what that analysis tends to play up are things like you know the uh indeterminate duration of um uh incarceration under that second path and uh the kinds of treatment that sometimes get hidden or muted uh but um it could go from you know from control of sexuality to other forms of um uh, of experience that can be prolonged, uh, including even after here in Canada, you know, even after there's been a formal uh, sort of declaration of fitness for release to supervised community release, but there's no spaces in the community because no one is prepared to sort of open those spaces. Uh, so that's uh, that's just, I guess, a question for you to, I'm really interested in your reaction to that argument that this alternative pathway is somehow itself um, discriminatory and in some you know i guess the 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 further question is well if that's too kind of blunt a response what what's the 
what's maybe the better response using the kind of legal frames that we have? Yeah, I think the classic legal answer to questions like that is as compared to what? <laughs> so I think the, um, I would agree in terms of the concerns of institutionalization um, that you flagged in terms of the indeterminacy and then process and uh, treatment and then the lack of alternatives in the community. Um, and I would agree with all of those. I would say that the United States is not governed under the CRPD. Um, although with um, we have case law under the ADA and the Americans with Disabilities Act that has um, a skepticism in terms of institutionalization. So one of the big cases, um, Olmstead is described as the Brown versus Board of Education of Disability, which does say that um, unjustified sort of institutionalization is per se discriminatory. And when I teach it, I bring cupcakes that day, that um, it is Brown, which is our big sort of racial segregation case um, in two ways. One is I think sort of this ringing claim and justice. And the other is what is the process and remedies that are actually going to happen? So when it came to Brown in terms of the all deliberate speed of integration, it hasn't really worked so well. Um, and then when it comes to Olmstead, yes, we have this language of unwarranted institutionalization, but in terms of increased resources of giving people alternatives, it hasn't really worked so well. Um, so I think part of it is, um, and I think a lot about democracy, is what is happening to people as wards, right? And that is going to be something that well, I think perhaps always fall into this trap of if things are done on people and they cannot direct it, then it's going to be draconian. It's going to be stingy. There's not a going to be a lot of alternatives. And it is going to be like spaces will be of folks who are pariahs and the spaces themselves will also be pariahs, right? So the so someplace like Worcester uh, Lunatic Asylum looks really beautiful from the outside, seems really great at the beginning, fills up with a whole bunch of people from prison, and then or a whole bunch of poor people, a whole bunch of Irish people, and then it becomes where they don't get any money, and then no one wants, no one else wants to go there. So um, I think part of it is like, how do we think of democracy and disability together, as opposed to just care and punishment, the management of a certain part of um, our communities. And then also really give scrutiny, like think more in terms of this issue of visibility. So on the one side, um, institutions can be horrible. And we, I assume both countries, we both have legacies of um, the shock and horror of what happens within institutions. That said though, I think with the Rogers case shows this, that horrible things can happen in people's families too and in their own houses. And that can also be something that is a problem. Um, and one thing that can be a question is sure that Abner's dad um, had this as a secret that he was revealing in this court case, right? To save his son's life. But well, his son was being tied to trees and chairs. They had neighbors, they had family members that saw this happen. And he was, and Bemaya was just there, right? And that was something that did, that was happening to him and people accepted that. So it is of um, the shift in terms of dignity and things that are like unacceptable, right? Sort of knitting together in that community needs to be something that is really hard to do. It's a heavy lift, but I think it does need to happen. And segregation does lend itself, I think, to this idea of dehumanization. So yes, I would be like generally pro-institutionalization, but it is sort of deinstitutionalization, deinstitutionalization. But I do not think that it is something that is a panacea. 
Um, and anytime that you have people that are just going to be subject to the, the whims of others, there's going to be a problem. So. Thank you so much for that. Um, and for the, the talk as a whole, I wish we, um, I feel like we're just launching onto a whole other, um, uh, you know, meeting and, and discussion that we could take a lot further around deinstitutionalization and the, the cultural and political, you know, sort of aspects of remedy spurred by yeah. law, perhaps, you know, as we've seen both yeah. in the States and here. I want to remind people of Professor Belt's um, forthcoming book, uh, Disabling Democracy in America, Mental Incompetence, Citizenship, Suffrage and the Law. 1819 to 1920. But once again, uh, I think that we learned so much um, from looking at our, our histories. Uh, and it, it just helps us to maybe detach that little bit, stand back from the present and understand it, um, maybe imagine it a little bit uh, differently. So important. Um, so uh, before I say my final thank you, I want to also remind people we have another seminar upcoming this month. It's Friday, November 24th. And that is Professor Katie Albrecht, who holds a Canada Research Chair in Health Equity and Social Justice at St. FX University. And the title of her talk, uh, which actually I think will carry on from this one really nicely, is Accessibility Legislation Catalyst for Culture Change in Mental Health Care. Oh, question fabulous. mark, right? <laughs> so um, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, ask you all to um, audibly applaud, but I know that you are with me in so warmly um, thanking Professor Belt for this wonderful lecture today. Thank you so much, Radhya. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've really enjoyed this and I really appreciate it. Um, and as Sheila said, this is these are weighty questions that we did not solve here, but I think the asking and really investigating matters so much. So I'm glad that we were all together for this. Um, thank you. Thanks again. Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.